Hey. This is my new microphone, <laughs> and normally I have like a magic wand type looking one. This one, I don't know what it says about me, I should probably feel like a social uh, secret service <laughs> angel or something, but it makes me feel more like a Backstreet Boy. <laughs> I wish I felt as cool as like, you know, presidential security, but I feel like Nick Carter. Um, so I do apologize for that but I kind of dig it at the same time. Um, my name's Michael, and as you can tell, Blake is not here. If you were here for the announcements, which I know it's hard to wake up that early, um, but his mother-in-law, Amanda Clark's uh, mother, passed away early this week, and so they had to fly up to West Virginia to go to the funeral and be with their family and stuff. So I have the privilege and honor of being here today to um, lead our gathering into hearing from and speaking to God, which is the purpose of our gathering at Radius. Um, every time, if you've ever heard me speak before, um, like on a stage like this, you know that there's always a couple things that I start out with. And I want to tell you a little bit of the story behind why I always start out like this. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is introduce God. And the reason that I do that is because there was a time in my life where I was in India and I was telling these stories about God and no one was really understanding them, even though I had a translator with me translating it. Um, I got, the one time I was in a, a second grade classroom, or equivalent, and uh, I told this story about Jonah and the whale and God, and that's one of my favorite stories. Um, but at the end, I was like, okay, do you guys have any questions? And this little kid, this adorable little kid, raised his hand and said, which God? Whoa. Because I hadn't set it aside that I was talking about one God, whereas this kid was coming from a culture where there's so many different ones, and he's heard stories about all these different ones, so I just want to make it clear the one God that I'm talking about. Um, revealed in the Bible as Yahweh, Jehovah, just a word, I am. That's how he reveals himself to us, how God reveals God's self to us as I am. And then throughout scripture, throughout the Bible, we get to understand more and see more of what he's like. And we know that he's personal. We know that he introduced himself with a name and said he wanted to have a relationship with us, each of us. We also know that he is unbridled, undomesticated, free love. That's what God is. The Bible's very clear that God is love. So that's the God that I'm talking about. So if I use the term God, um, I'm talking about this specific entity in the world who created the world and the universe and gave your mind the capacity to love and your hearts the willingness to love. That's the God that I'm talking about, just so we have that clear. There's another phrase I'm going to use, which is Jesus. And that's a name, um, not a Mexican name like Jesus, but Jesus in uh, Hebrew. It's kind of like the equivalent of Joshua something like that. And Jesus was a guy that lived in Nazareth. He was born in Galilee and Nazareth and Bethlehem. You've probably heard the story. I'm not going to rehash all of it today, um, but we'll see on Christmas. <laughs> and we can go over that whole thing in detail. But um, he was born and he lived and he, uh, he was announced as the Christ. And so there's Jesus and then there's the Christ. The Christ is this thing that throughout the Bible, was promised and said, this is what's going to reunite us with God, the Christ, the Messiah, both from the words uh, for oil, actually, for this anointing oil that they would put on the heads of kings. So Messiah is the Hebrew equivalent, Christ is the Greek equivalent of that anointing oil. Boring, shove it away in your heads for jeopardy. Um, but those are the two words, so Christ and Jesus is proclaimed as the Christ, the one that's going to save us and the one that's going to reunite us with God, because it's really easy to fall away from love. I'm sure we've all done that in our lives. We feel like we're separate from love. We feel like there's no love in the universe or in the world or in our own selves. And Jesus of Nazareth was the one who was going to embody, to incarnate God, love, on this earth. Does that make sense? It doesn't to me. It's a lot. It's a really big idea. But incarnation, enfleshment, the embodiment, the personalization of love here. Jesus was here for about 33 years. He died and then he rose again. Then he went back up, that Christ went back up to heaven to be with God where the Bible teaches he was before he came on this earth for 33 years. Lots of big stuff that I will wrestle with for the rest of my life. So, I say all those things and I know that they're confusing, they're confusing to me. But here's another thing I want to talk about, is God's chosen people he names Israel. Israel, name, the name actually means struggles against God. 
struggles against love. Love is a difficult thing. That's what we're talking about today, is love, and so I just want to struggle with it with you guys. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I want to start <laughs> off, so now that I got through that, I want to start off with a little bit of a game. So this series is called Itty, and it's about how small things can become huge things and change our lives. If we have our priorities right, if we have increased capacity and generosity, our lives will bloom and become these big, gigantic, powerful things. So I'm going to start things off with starting a phrase or a song or a word, and then I want everybody in unison, because we're talking about unity, to finish it off if you can, okay? I'm going to start us off easy, because I mentioned Christmas. Rudolph the Red. Perfect, that was fantastic. Okay, this one's a little bit harder, and I hope I can get my voice to do it correctly and you guys can follow along. Na 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 Perfect, you guys are killing it. Next one, Luke, I am. That was good. I threw that one in there just for my own benefit. All right, this one might need a prop. Are these microphones muted? Yes. Okay. This one is a little. You can keep them muted, please. All right. All right. Thank you, setup team, for being so good at your job. So I have to hold the microphone like this when I do this one. Let's get ready to rumble! Perfect. That was the one I was afraid you wouldn't get, but I'm glad you got it. So the next one I want to do um, is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Well, what's next, like, after the words? So that all will be saved. That's close. That's very, very close. Can we put up uh, John 3.17? For God sent not the Son into the world to condemn the world, the world but the world might be saved through. That's the key. What's that? Let's go back through it one more time, just in case we didn't hear it. So, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Meaning, through God, through Jesus, through the Christ. Okay? So that's what comes next after that thing. Jesus, the Christ, was with God before time. Everything was created through him. And then in this 33 years of Jesus on earth, he embodied that christ -ness. Okay, And the point was that we should all be saved. We should all be redeemed by God into love with him. Okay, So that's where we're starting off today. We're going to go and look at the very, very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, I think it says. Uh, but we'll see it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So this is the very opening of the Bible, the very opening of the Scriptures. And what we see here, I think, is an analogy for all of our lives. Have you ever felt like your life... Let's go back to verse 1, please. Formless and empty. Have you ever felt like your life was formless and empty? Have you ever gone to work for 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day and thought, uh, what's the point? This is, I really, there's another translation that says formless and void. Complete and utter chaos. There's no form. There's not even day for night. There's not even light and darkness. There's just uh, nothingness. My life feels like that sometimes. I know your life feels like that sometimes because we're all people and we're all on this earth. So, what does God do? He speaks and he creates light. When he speaks, this formless void becomes light. And then there's darkness also, and they're separated. One is day and one is night. That's what happens here. God looks at the earth that he created, the world that he created, and he says, there needs to be some goodness here. So he speaks goodness into reality, and it becomes light. And so now there's evening and there's morning, and there's a way to measure time, and there's a way for us to track our days so we don't seem so formless and empty. You ever go to work and you look at the clock and it's only three, but it feels like five? <laughs> this is why God created day and night, is so that we wouldn't think, I'm going to be here forever, like I do, or around three o'clock at work. So, God speaks, creates light, and creates goodness. He begins this relationship with humans, with the creatures of this earth, so that he can love them and make their formless and emptiness into goodness and light. 
that starts all with this just one God speaking into the world to create this goodness of life. Then some things happen. Humans come about, and uh, we're on this earth, and we have a propensity to screw things up. I do. I hope you guys that are in the same boat as me, I screw things up a lot. Um, so there's this human propensity to foul things up. And so we get our hands dirty and we make messes and we take this order, this day and this night, this light and this dark, this goodness and this badness, and we confuse the crap out of them. We make it so confusing that the formlessness comes back into our lives, right? So what does God do? He speaks again. And he says in Isaiah, so this is about halfway through the Bible, if you're interested in that, in Isaiah, actually a couple verses uh, before what Aaron read this morning, we didn't plan that. But um, a couple verses before what Aaron said, God speaks through this man called Isaiah, and Isaiah says, God's going to send someone, he's going to be born on earth, like every other human, he's going to be born on earth, and he's going to be called Emmanuel. Now, the word Emmanuel in Hebrew means God with us. El being a name for God, God the Father, and Imanu meaning with us. Uh, the other name that you may have heard that's similar to that is like Manuel, Another Mexican name? I don't know, they're so good at taking these Hebrew words and making them awesome names, like Jesus and Manuel. Manuel would mean with God. So, somebody who's on the side of God, Manuel. Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us. So there's going to be this person, he's going to be born like a human, he's going to be here on the earth, and he's going to be God with us. He's going to be the embodiment of this love, of this thing that creates order and light and goodness on earth. That's mind-blowing, right? That's crazy for us to think, and it already happened, and we, a lot of us have faith that it happened, and it's still really crazy for us to think about. Now, think about if that was the headline the day you woke up in the Israel Morning Times, and Isaiah is saying, hey, God is going to come to earth in the form of a human, and it's going to be God with us. God is coming with us. God is going to be with us, finally, again, just like when he created us in these stories, okay? God is going to be with us again. That's big news. Then what happens? 400 years of darkness and formlessness and void. When God says, Jesus is coming, or Emmanuel is coming, and he's going to be God with you again. I'm going to be on the surface of the earth, hovering about the waters like I was in the beginning, and I'm going to be with you, but this time in the form of a human. After Isaiah makes that proclamation that God says this to him, darkness. God doesn't speak anymore after that. There's no more prophets. There's no more words from God. There might be little isolated ones, but in the Bible, there's a big old gap. Amanda talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's called the intertestamental period, or intertestamental period, depending on your convention of language. But it's this 400-year gap where there's no prophets and there's no people saying, I got a message from God, and here's what's going to happen, and, and God still loves us, and God is going to come and be with us again. There's no more of that. So these Israelites, these people that were said to be struggling with God and the chosen people of God are now in darkness and don't have any more words from God. And God feels like he's so far away from us. And God is not with us, even though this promise was given that God was going to be with us. So it's darkness and it's emptiness and it's formless and void again. So then one day a messenger comes to this young woman, Mary, and says, hey, you're going to have a kid and you're supposed to call it Emmanuel. And that, again, is mind-blowing, because this woman, Mary, never had any kids before, as far as we can tell. She wasn't even married. She was married. She wasn't married. And um, this messenger, thank you, that was like a delay. <laughs> so you put that on the way home. But, um, yeah, so Mary wasn't married. She didn't have any kids. And a messenger comes to her, an angel, that's the Greek word for messenger, um, comes to her and says, you're going to have a kid and it's going to be Emmanuel. And then automatically, because she's Jewish and she has struggled with God and she's struggled against God and she is one of God's chosen people who is called struggling with God, she remembers this promise in Isaiah that, hey, a child is going to be born to a young woman who hasn't had any kids before and isn't married and they're going to call him Emmanuel. And so this messenger says the exact same thing and says, it's going to be you. And so that, again, is another promise. God is speaking again into the world. The darkness is over. Now this formlessness and this void is over. And now Jesus is coming. Emmanuel is coming. God will be with us again. Praises ring out for 33 years. Everybody's confused. Jesus is here. He is the embodiment, the enfleshment, the personification of love of God. 
He is in unison with God. He is united with God. And he speaks as if he was the Christ, the one who is going, this cosmic force in the universe that is going to pull us back to God and be with us again so that we can be with goodness and light and love. Jesus is here. Strange thing happens. Jesus dies. Nobody expected that to happen because the other promises that people were saying were that he was going to be king, he was going to rule over this land forever, and there would be a thousand years of his reign, and it would never end. But Jesus dies. Jesus dies for three days. That's it. Most people that I know that have died have been dead since they died. <laughs> Jesus was dead for three days. He comes back, says some things to his disciples. That's what we're going to focus on right now. I know there's a lot of lead up to that story. That's like thousands of years of history that we just blew through. We're going to focus on what Jesus says to his disciples after he comes back. Because he comes back, but then he leaves again. I don't know if you're aware, Jesus is not here on this earth anymore. He's not still walking around over in Galilee. He's not, he's not buried somewhere in a, in a grave. But we're going to get to that. Because what we are called is the body of Christ on earth. The church, our church, Radius, and the churches that believe that Jesus was the Christ is now called the body of Christ on earth. That has some huge implications. God with us. God was with us in Jesus. Right? He was here. He was doing the things that God does. What does God do? God heals. God provides. God forgives. God restores. God draws near to the brokenhearted. That's exactly what Jesus did when he was here on earth. Jesus is not here on earth anymore. Jesus, it says, the Bible says, is living in heavens at the right hand of God. He's not here anymore. He doesn't have a physical body like he used to in order to draw near to the brokenhearted, in order to feed, in order to provide, in order to heal, in order to love, to be that personification of God anymore. But what does the Bible say about us? We are the body of Christ on earth today. So, uh, let's go to the scripture, because I don't want you to just take my word on that. Romans 12.5 says, So in Christ we, though many individuals, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So in Christ, we are created as the body of Christ. So now, this cosmic force, this part of God that was the Christ, that was the redemption, that was the salvation, that was going to bring us in love with God, the Christ has no body anymore. It doesn't have Jesus' body. Does this make sense? Jesus was here. He was the Christ. He was the embodiment, the incarnation of God. Right? Jesus' body dies and goes up to heaven and is sitting there at the throne of God on his right hand. The Christ is still here. Does that make sense? The salvation, the redemption, the things that can turn darkness into light and make things in order and make love good and light spread like it did over the form of those, uh, over the formlessness of the waters before creation, just like it did uh, when Jesus was here and he was healing people by touching them and he was spitting in people's eyes and he was turning over tables, it can still be that creative force for salvation, for love. We're going to go to another verse, which is Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. I pray, this is Paul writing to a church that he started. So it would be like, hey, Blake's in West Virginia. He's writing us a letter from there. Similar thought. So Paul is away and he writes to a church that he started in Ephesus. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. He's talking about Jesus there, God. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. <laughs> um, the point that I want you to get, can we go back to the part that says the, the power is the same? I think it's like 19 maybe. So, um, I, I told you about Jesus being dead for three days, right? Then, suddenly he wasn't dead, he was alive again. He had, Christ had a body again, and it was here on this earth with us. It was God with us. Then, Jesus says to his disciples, after he has healed so many people, after he has fed thousands of people, after he has atoned for the sins of the world on the cross, after he has died, been dead and rotting for three days, and comes back to life, 
He says what to the disciples? He says, you will do even greater things than I have on this earth. He says, you who believe, those who believe in me, will do even greater things than I have on this earth. Do we have that scripture, uh, Tyler? I may not have given it to you. Let's try John 12, 14. Is that something? Right? 14, 12. Yep, that's it. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the work that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus says, hey, I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here anymore. But you guys, you who believe in me, I tell you, very truly, I tell you, you will do the things that I've been doing and even greater things. Do you know why that is? Because there's more of us. Because we can unite the you know, 80, 90 people in this room can unite under that same power, just like it says in Ephesians, the power that rose Christ from the dead. Once again, that doesn't happen. Everybody I know that has died is still dead. The power that rose Christ from the dead is here, and those who believe have the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of God. That is the Spirit of love in the universe, in the world, in all of creation. God. We have that. And Jesus himself this person that we've elevated to be the most holy of holies that says it's, he's sitting at the right hand of God. He says, you're going to do even greater things than me. That's wild. We need to unite so that we can. This is why I want to talk about unity. This is why unity is the last part of the itty series, because it's another small thing. But what unity does is boosts up all the other three parts that we've been talking about. If you've been here, we talked about priorities. We talked about getting our priorities straight so that we can be more receptive to that Holy Spirit of God that gives us power and dignity and love in our lives. That's what priorities are about. We talked about capacity. We talked about opening ourselves up to, to take on that Spirit of God, to be able to receive from God those attributes, love, dignity, justice, mercy, grace, increasing our capacity to have those things in us. Jesus had a wonderful capacity for those things. We as the body must unite so that our capacity can increase. Generosity. Jesus was so generous. <laughs> Jesus was crazy generous. Jesus took things that he could have had. In fact, the Bible says Jesus didn't see uh, comparison with God as something to be grasped, but instead he gave it up. Jesus who had the ability to be God. Jesus, this Christ force in the universe, could have just stayed in heaven. The Bible says in, I think it's Galatians, we don't have the verse, Tyler, so don't stress yourself out. Um, I think it's in Galatians, we can talk about that later if you want. God and Jesus were together, and the Spirit was up there in heaven, in the heavenly realms, as they say. And it says Jesus didn't take equality with God as something to be grasped, but he gave it up so that he could be here, so that he could be God with us, so that he could be the Christ on earth. And he did that. That's the most generous thing I've ever heard of. Uh, so, unity boosts all of these things up. When we are united in our priorities, when we're united and 80, 90, 200 of us are putting God first in our lives, our priorities will be straight. And that will change St. Petersburg. That will change the world. That will bring light into this darkness. And that will change this formlessness. It will change the formlessness that you feel at work. It will change the formlessness that you feel in everyday life. And it will reach out to change St. Petersburg from a formless, empty, void place into a place where there is goodness and light and Jesus. That's what will happen if we get our priorities straight and we are united in that capacity. Could you imagine if all of us together increased our capacity and devoted ourselves to receiving more of that love that Jesus embodied on earth? If we all united and decided, I'm going to increase my capacity to give and to serve and to lead and to put myself last? Generosity. I find those two really overlap for me, capacity and generosity, because the more we give, the bigger our buckets are to receive. So generosity, could you imagine if we all became the most generous people on earth. You know what's funny is there's a park that I'm sure a lot of you know about a couple blocks from here called Unity Park. And I drove past it today. And there are there was probably 40 to 50 people sleeping in the grass, uh, drinking out of cans that are in bags. They were just, they were in Unity Park. And it looked formless and empty. 
that's what formlessness and emptiness looks like today. Is people without homes that don't that that have been living in darkness, that feel like God is not with us. So here at Radius, we have what we call partnership. Partnership are our partners are people that have dedicated and committed to acting on the belief that God is with us. There are some commitments that they make. Uh, partners, they uh, sign this thing and read this thing and take this class about how if we are to be united, we are committing ourselves to serve, to pray, and to give. Generosity, capacity, priority. And so if you're interested in partnership, I have to do this because I teach the partnership class. <laughs> partnership class, the next one will be February 21st. Um, if you're interested in more, you can ask me later. That's not the point of this whole message, but I just really want to throw that in there. Because we do have people in Radius who have committed to this. Committed to acting on the belief that God is with us. Here's my charge to you today. If you believe that Jesus was God with us, how today will you act on that belief? How will you act on the belief that the Christ force is here and in us? How will you act on the promise that Jesus says, you will do even greater things than I have? What? That's a lot. What are we doing as a result of what Jesus says to us? He says, you have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. And if you believe, you will do even greater things than me. What are you individually doing? And how can we as Radius unite around you and with you and all of us together to act on those things? This gathering is about hearing from and speaking to God. I want to spend a little bit of time here, and we're going to do some, I mean, this is so weird. Like, you've never gone to any other gathering besides church where they say, okay, everybody close your head and bow your eyes. I understand that this is weird. But what I want to do is be intentional about it and spend some time, all of us, united. Could you imagine if you went to a football game and they're like, okay, everybody now close your eyes now. I get it. It's weird. It's really, really weird. But we're going to take a couple minutes. I would love for you to close your eyes and bow your head so that we can ask God to speak to us. I'm going to pray, and then there's going to be a couple moments of silence, um, and then we are going to go on with this. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're like. God, I ask that you would speak to us. God, I ask that you would bring about change in our lives. God, I ask that we would be able to hear from you now, to hear how we can do these things that Jesus was doing when he was here on this earth. How we can embody your love, your salvation, your truth. God, I pray that you would plant into our minds in this couple of minutes just one idea, one itty bitty idea for each of us that we would be able to unite around. I ask that you would speak to us how each of us can create order and light in this world to combat the formlessness and the emptiness. God, I ask that when we do speak these things, when we do speak these ideas, when we bring these ideas up, when we start acting on these ideas, that you, just like you did with Jesus and just like you did when you created light, you would look at our ideas that you've given us and say, oh, that's good. We ask for these things from you, God. Please speak to us in these minutes.